Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm Rika Kierkegaard, Program Specialist with the HIV and AIDS section at UNICEF headquarters in New York. And I can see we're still having uh, people joining us. We're at uh, just over 100 participants now, but we have quite um, a packed program today, so I'll just get started. Um, we're very pleased to welcome you all to the second webinar in a new series of monthly webinars from the Children and AIDS Learning Collaborative. And these women are, are zooming in on what pediatric HIV programs need to know about COVID-19 and HIV. In today's session, we will be providing scientific updates on COVID-19 and children, examples of pediatric and adolescent HIV program delivery adaptations. And finally, we'll have some voices from the front line of the pandemic, through a video blog and through presentation of findings from the PATA Frontline Health Provider COVID-19 survey. With us today, we have six different speakers. We have Dr. Lynn Mofensen, Technical Advisor to the Research Program at ECPAF, Maria Vivas Alicea, HIV AIDS Specialist at UNICEF Lesotho, who's presenting with two implementing partners from Help, uh, Help Lesotho, Shatrak Mutembe, Country Director, and Shasha Mahkauta, Youth and Gender Coordinator. We have Moses Buire, Executive Director of Peer to Peer Uganda. And last but not least, Violet Nabate, who is pediatrician at Malme Uganda Hospital and member of the PATA Action Network of Frontline Health Providers. We also have my colleague, Shafiq Esaji with us, who is Senior HIV Advisor at UNICEF New York Headquarters, and he will be moderating incoming questions and answers. Before we get started, um, I'd like to say a few words about the webinar guidelines. If you have any technical issues, please send us a message via the chat box, uh, and we will try to support you as soon as possible. If you have any general comments, please also send them through the chat box and select all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to be able to see your comment. If you have a question for any of the speakers, please send them at any time, but only using the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of the Zoom window. And please also mention who your question is addressed to. After each block of presentations, there will be a few minutes for any immediate questions for the speakers, and we will then open up for general Q&A and address remaining questions at the end of the webinar. The webinar is being recorded and the recording and PowerPoint will be made available online after the webinar on childrenaids.org slash COVID-19, where you will also be able to find many more resources from UNICEF and partners and participate in discussions related to COVID-19, um, HIV, children and pregnant women. I would now like to open this webinar with a presentation by Dr. Lynn Mofensen, who is working as technical advisor to the research program at the Elizabeth Glaser Pediatric AIDS Foundation. She was at the National Institutes of Health from 1989 until her retirement in 2014, where she was responsible for program planning and the development and scientific direction of research studies and clinical trials in domestic and international pediatric adolescent and maternal HIV infection. So without further ado, I will hand over to you, Lynn. Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to provide an update since our last webinar for this uh, webinar. So I want to continue to please note that the data continue to be preliminary. The data continue to have some of poor quality, and they change almost daily. Um, uh, and you can see the outline of my talk on this slide. So I want to start talking about what's new. I'm going to talk a little bit about timing of diagnostic testing, uh, data on HIV co-infection, and a little bit on treatment. So viral RT-PCR testing detects the gene segments of SARS-CoV-2, not necessarily infectivity. And I would um, refer people to this article, which I thought was very nice in terms of describing diagnostic testing. So for RT-PCR respiratory samples, nasopharyngeal in blue, upper respiratory tract in orange, bronchial alveolar lavage in uh, pink, become positive several days prior to the onset of symptoms. Stool, which is in yellow, um, uh, is positive in about 57% of patients, and that becomes positive a little bit later and persists longer. 
uh, PCR positivity persists for the duration of symptoms or about 12 to 14 days if no symptoms, but shedding can be prolonged and it's related to the severity of the illness. And PCR can be positive after recovery, but it may be detecting viral fragments that are not necessarily reflecting infectious virus. In terms of antibody testing, IgM, which is in purple, and IgG in green, start to develop about seven days, and the median seroconversion time for IgM is 18 days post-exposure, and for IgG is 20 days post-exposure. So a negative IgM or IgG test early in the course of illness does not rule out infection. An IgG is indicative of prior infection, the duration of IgG is not known, and it's presumed to indicate immunity, but that's not yet been proven. So I want to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and HIV. This, these are data from um, all the reports I could find that related to HIV and COVID. Shows you the author, the country, the number, age, whether or not the patients were on treatment, CD4 viral load, comorbidity symptoms, and outcome. So there were 12 reports on 108 patients. All of them were adults. 99% were on treatment. Most had CD4 over 500 and 93% were suppressed. 59% of those who were ill had comorbidities, uh, about 2% were asymptomatic, and most had mild to moderate disease, mortality was 5%. So the outcome here looks very similar to overall COVID-19 patients and does not appear to be worse. A little bit on treatment. Uh, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine plus minus azithromycin does not appear to be effective in hospitalized COVID-19 patients and may actually be harmful, as you can see in these uh, different papers from JAMA, New England Journal, and British Medical Journal, although it's still being evaluated in some clinical trials in adults. But just um, two days ago, WHO paused its large trial of hydroxychloroquine, asking their data safety monitoring board to review the data because of safety concerns. Uh, for remdesivir, the story is a little different. Remdesivir is a nucleotide analog with conflicting results on efficacy in observational studies. But in a randomized trial of over 1,000 patients, showed efficacy in short, shortening time to recovery in hospitalized adults and a trend towards improved survival, 7.1% with remdesivir versus 11.9% with placebo, and further trials are ongoing. Now, there have been case reports of use in pregnancy and in children, and it is available by compassionate use, but there are no clinical trials involving pregnant women or children. And just a comment that I feel like we're making the same mistake over and over again, that we made the same mistake with HIV drugs, with TB drugs. We didn't study it in pregnant women and children until very late. And I just point out um, two recent advocacy pieces um, talking about the importance of inclusion of pregnant and breastfeeding women and children in COVID-19 therapeutic trials. So let's move on and talk about COVID-19 in children. So an interesting study recently published showed that children may have lower levels of nasal ACE2 enzyme than adults. So the ACE2 enzyme is the receptor for um, SARS-CoV-2. And this was a retrospective exam of stored nasal epithelium for over 300 persons. Um, from age four to 60 years. And this is from a study that was looking at nasal markers of asthma from a couple of years ago. And what they did was evaluate ACE2 enzyme gene expression in stored samples. And this shows you the gene expression in log two counts per million by age. And you can see that ACE2 enzyme gene expression was age dependent and was lowest in children uh, under 10 and increased with age. And ACE2 was significantly lower in children under 10 than older persons. And this was independent of sex or asthma. So the prevalence of COVID-19 in children has been cited as one to 2% of all cases, but this is based on initial data from, data from China. 
and there's actually no easy way to be able to get global age-related data for the pediatric age groups. And when you examine individual data by country, the prevalence may actually be higher than the often cited 1% to 2%. Additionally, there may be underreporting of pediatric COVID-19 from Africa. So this is a table that shows you uh, different countries, the total cases, uh, and then the age breakdown. And in order to get this, I had to go to many individual websites to be able to get the data. So the total number of cases um, of all of these different countries is about 2.1 million, about 77,000 uh, were children aged zero to 19, or 3.6%, with 1.2% being zero to nine years, and 2.4% being 10 to 18 years. And you can see there's a wide variety of um, prevalence. And I just point out that in Africa, at least on the site that I looked at, the prevalence was only 0.6%, suggesting some underreporting. And just to point out that it really shouldn't be this hard to be able to get age-related data on COVID-19. This took a very long time. So among children with COVID-19, it's very difficult to also get disaggregated data to evaluate proportional representation by age. I was able to find five studies from three different countries on a little over 5,000 children 18% were less than one, 18% one to four to five, they didn't even um, use the same age range. So we had about a third of the cases are zero to five, and nearly 45% of the cases are over 10, 10 to 18. With the caveat that younger children may have less typical symptoms and therefore less likely to be tested. And once again, it shouldn't be this hard to get age-related data. So in terms of clinical characteristics, there was a recent systematic review of um, pediatric COVID-19 um, involving 62 studies over, over 7,000 children. And I would definitely recommend people to look at this. The mean age was 7.6 years, 52% male. They were mostly from three countries, Italy, US, and China. The vast majority of children were exposed in their family, and the review only considered confirmed cases. So first, the data continue to show that children generally have mild to moderate disease. So 57% of the children um, had asymptomatic or mild disease, 96% had asymptomatic to moderate disease, Severe disease was seen in only 2%, and this compares to 15% in adults. Children have fewer symptoms than adults, most commonly fever and cough. And on the left, you see um, from the uh, systematic review disease symptoms, and on the right, you see symptoms in adults from the United States. So there were lower rates of all symptoms, including fever in blue and cough in orange, and significantly less amount of dyspnea in gray than seen in adults. Consistent with less severe disease, laboratory findings in children with COVID-19 are also less abnormal than in adults. And again, we see laboratory findings from children on the left and in adults. Now this is data from China on the right. And there were lower rates of lymphopenia in yellow and a lower rate of elevated CRP in green. Um, lower rates of everything, but these two are important because both of these are associated with more severe disease in adults. And consistent with less severe disease, children were less likely to require intensive care or significant treatment. We have uh, the children on the right and adults on the left. Um, so children were less likely to require oxygen in blue, ICU admission in orange, or mechanical ventilation in yellow than adults, and they were also less likely to receive adjunctive therapy like antibiotics in green, steroids in kind of pink, and IVIG in blue than did adults. And mortality was significantly different, 0.08% for children, 1.4% for adults in this study from China. So do symptoms differ in the youngest children compared to older children? 
Um, they were able to look at this in 11 studies, um, including 25 infants compared to the overall, and a higher proportion of newborns had severe disease. So if we look at asymptomatic to mild disease, 88% in the newborns, 96% in the children overall, but more importantly, severe disease was significantly more common in the newborns and infants under three months, 12% versus 2% in children overall. Newborns and infants aged less than three months were less likely to have symptoms of fever and cough, but more likely to have dyspnea. So you can see uh, fever and cough, blue and orange, are much less in the newborns, but dyspnea in green was much more common in the infants uh, under three than overall children. Newborns and infants were less likely to have markers of inflammation than older children. Um, so the younger infants were more likely to have a high white count than a low white count in the um, newborns compared to the children, and were less likely to have high inflammatory markers like CRP in green. And newborns aged less than three months were um, less likely to require specific treatments, but actually more likely to go to the intensive care unit. So you can see 52% of infants were treated only symptomatically compared to 21% in children in blue, but admission to the NICU in orange was 8% compared to 2% in older children. But this may be because neonates um, born to um, women with COVID-19 are more likely to be premature and have complications of prematurity. And also they are often admitted for observation because of COVID-19 in the mother. So I'm not sure this really indicates more intensive care needed. Talk a little bit about comorbidities and hospitalizations. These are data from uh, the US. In um, green, you see pediatric. In blue, you see adults. And it's listing the different types of comorbidities in patients with co uh, COVID-19. So 92% of hospitalized adults had at least one underlying condition, most common hypertension, obesity, metabolic disease, and cardiovascular disease. In contrast, only 61% of hospitalized children had one underlying or one or more underlying conditions, most commonly obesity, asthma, and neurologic disease. So what do children with severe COVID-19 look like? And these are data from a cross-sectional study of 48 children with COVID-19 admitted to 46 North American PICUs uh, in the last uh, month. 83% uh, had uh, pre-existing underlying medical conditions, so very high. 73% presented with respiratory symptoms. 38% required invasive mechanical ventilation. And in-hospital mortality was 4.2% compared to the 0.08% in the systematic review. So while children have milder disease than adults, they can also be extremely ill. And if admitted to the ICU, they have elevated mortality. This looks at severe COVID-19 in children and young adults in Washington, DC. They uh, reported on 177 children that they saw. 75%, 133 were not hospitalized. So the typical um, mild disease. 25% were hospitalized, 5% needed crit uh, critical care, including mechanical ventilation in four. 39% had comorbidities, and in those hospitalized, it was much more frequent than those not hospitalized. The median age was 9.6 years, but it is the youngest children under one and the oldest children, 15 to 25, who are most likely to need hospitalization and critically ill patients in green were more likely to be adolescents and young adults with a mean age of 17.3 years. So adolescents and young adults with COVID-19 may be more likely to have the cytokine storm picture seen in adults. So I wanna move on and talk about the multi-system inflammatory disease syndrome temporally associated with COVID-19 in children. And this is a uh, picture from the cover of the Washington Post a few days ago, reporting on a healthy 12-year-old who got COVID-19 and ended up having two cardiac arrests and luckily is alive and doing well now. 
So there's an emerging syndrome in mid to late April. There were reports from Western Europe identifying a new febrile pediatric entity, including systemic hyperinflammation, multi-organ involvement, abdominal pain, GI symptoms, features simple, similar to Kawasaki's disease uh, with a prominent cardiogenic shock and myocardial dysfunction. Most of these children tested positive either by RT-PCR or IgG and IgM to SARS-CoV-2, although they may not have had symptoms of disease. By early May, cases had been reported in New York City with the health alert issued first by the city and then by the state in early May. And by May 12th, there were 102 cases reported in New York with three deaths. May 14th, CDC issued a health advisory with a case definition and requested reporting of cases in the US. And in May 15th, WHO issued a scientific brief, a preliminary case definition, and a request for reporting to a global clinical data platform and set up a global collaborative research forum. By May 26th, this disease entity has been reported in children in 23 states from the US. And since the first published report in April, there's been an explosion of publications in the US and Europe, 17 publications in the last four weeks. So temporally, this syndrome began to manifest approximately one month after the peak of COVID-19 cases in Europe and the US, rather than being uh, contemporaneous with the epidemic peak. Most children have evidence of SARS-CoV-2, but not necessarily current infection, but more likely antibody indicating past infection, suggesting a post-infectious inflammatory process that may be immune complex mediated. And it resembles, some cases resemble Kawasaki's disease and shock syndrome. And the clinical picture possibly resembles what we see in the later phase of adult COVID-19 with a cytokine storm. This is just a picture of Kawasaki's disease. It requires uh, four of six possible findings, conjunctival injection, peripheral edema, cervical lymph nodes, a rash, strawberry tongue, red fissured lips. And it is a self-limited vasculitis of childhood thought that to be precipitated by a common infectious pathogen resulting in immune mediated response in genetically predisposed children with the most important complication being coronary artery aneurysms. So this syndrome differs a little bit from uh, Kawasaki's disease in that Kawasaki's disease is primarily seen in young infants, 50% are less than 24 months, 80% are less than five years, compared to a mean age of eight to 10 years with this syndrome, including adolescents. Additionally, uh, Kawasaki's disease is more frequent in Asian countries, but to date it has not been, uh, this particular syndrome with SARS has not been seen in Asia yet. And in several series, it looks like it's more often seen in children of African ancestry. The clinical uh, features of this disease are more impressive than Kawasaki's disease with abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, and multi-organ involvement, including acute kidney injury. And cardiac features are very prominent, showing moderate to severe myocardial involvement, much more than seen usually with Kawasaki's disease. And laboratory features are also distinct in that uh, inflammatory markers are markedly raised with this syndrome as opposed to Kawasaki's disease. And this just shows you a picture of the manifestations. And in red, you see signs and symptoms consistent with Kawasaki's disease. And in black, you see signs that are rare to see in Kawasaki's disease, including the prominent left ventricular dysfunction. And the percentages here come from a case series of 35 cases that were reported from France and uh, Switzerland. The treatment of this disorder is primarily supportive care of acute organ dysfunction and shock. Most improve with intravenous IVIG with or without steroids, which act to modulate cytokine activation. And other immune modulators have also been used if non-responded to this first line therapy, including IL-1 and IL-6 blockers. And as I noted, it hasn't been reported from Asian countries or from Africa, but surveillance for it has also been limited to non-existent until now. 
So we have a possible widening spectrum of disorders in children with SARS-CoV-2. And this should actually be the bottom of the pyramid, COVID-19 in children generally mild or asymptomatic. A smaller proportion may uh, present with persistent fever and mild inflammation. Uh, a smaller proportion may have Kawasaki's like disease manifestations and the very small proportion present with this multi-system syndrome and shock. And this is just the WHO website, uh, their preliminary case definition and their case report forms. And uh, you can all have the slides that have the web uh, link to this. So while COVID-19 seems relatively less frequent and more benign in pediatrics, severe cases have been reported and the appearance may be biased by our incomplete knowledge of this new disease in children. Similar to adults, children with comorbidities appear overrepresented in uh, those with more severe disease. And this recent emergence of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children with SARS-CoV-2, either current or past, demonstrates how disease due to this virus in children remains yet to be defined. So I want to end with a few studies talking about the impact of the COVID-19 response on HIV and maternal and child health services. Uh, talk about three modeling exercises. Um, the first modeled three scenarios where coverage of essential maternal and child health interventions are reduced by 5, 10, or 15 percent, so small, moderate, or large decrease in services, and child wasting increases by 5, 10, or 15 percent in 118 low and middle income countries. So on the, on the left, you see child deaths per month. On the right, you see maternal deaths per month. And in pink is additional uh, deaths that occur. So depending on the scenario, there could be an increase of 9.8 to 44.7% in under age five child deaths per month and 8.3 to 38.6% increase in maternal deaths per month across 118 countries, depending on disruption of services. Uh, this uh, data comes from UNAIDS. They examined the effects of a three or six month service uh, disruption due to lockdown and health system capacity constraints on HIV incidents, including mother to child transmission in four African countries, Zimbabwe, Uganda, Mozambique, and Malawi. Um, they noted that currently PMTCT coverage is high and there are few new child infections, but that any disruption in PMTCC services could lead to large increases in new child infections, including a 10% increase if disruption is only for new patients getting treatment, 50% for three month disruption for all treatment, and 100% increase for uh, six month disruption. And this final uh, report modeled five different intervention scenarios for COVID-19. No action, mitigation, suppression, and then list, unmanaged and well-managed suppression um, to decrease uh, COVID-19. And you see the COVID-19 deaths in the black line and the different types of disruption uh, by color over here. Uh, and they looked at the impact on extra deaths due to HIV, TB, and malaria, 2020 to 2024. So for HIV, there was up to a 10% increase in deaths, primarily due to art interruption during high and extreme health service demand. So that's the orange and the black. For TB, up to a 20% increase in TB deaths, and this is primarily due to reduction in timely diagnosis and treatment of new cases from a long period of suppression interventions, either unmanaged or well-managed, that limit activities. So this is the dark brown and the blue. And for malaria, they expected up to a 36% increase in malaria deaths. And this is due primarily to reduced prevention activities, such as distribution of insectified treated nets in all phases of the response. So what all three models illustrate is the critical importance of maintaining maternal and child health services and HIV, TB, and malaria specific services as much as possible as part of the COVID-19 response to reduce a potential broader potential public health impact uh, of these interventions on maternal and child mortality. And uh, that's it for me. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Lynn, for this excellent overview of COVID updates and the emerging picture of infection in, uh, in children. We now have a couple of minutes if there are any um, immediate questions for Lynn from the Q&A box before moving on to the next presentation. So if you one question, Shafiq, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Rike, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Lynn, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we have one question so far on the chat box. Um, and Lucy asks, uh, you talk about the importance of looking at pregnant women and children. And I know this is a question that is close to your heart. Would it be recommended uh, to include pregnant women and children in treatment trials, given that we still do not fully understand the safety profiles of most of these drugs? So um, I think what we're talking about is looking at the most seriously ill patients here. Um, I would not necessarily recommend inclusion of children and pregnant women who are asymptomatic. However, if you've got a pregnant woman or a child who's in the ICU and intubated, those in those particular cases, I think even though we don't have a full safety profile, that they deserve to be able to be studied just like other adults in whom we don't have a uh, full safety profile for the drugs. There, there is, if, if you have a life-threatening disease, I don't think that there is an excuse not to be able to study treatment just because the woman is pregnant or because it is a child. Thanks very much, Lynn. We have another question from Emma asking about a, a study that you may or may not have heard of, uh, yeah. recently published uh, from Germany that identified SARS-CoV-2 in breast milk in one case. Uh, in your experience and in, in the literature that you have looked at, Lynn, um, is this concerning and is it something to alter our recommendations to encourage breastfeeding even among women with confirmed COVID? Yeah, so um, there have been, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but maybe um, 30 evaluations of breast milk um, for the virus. This is the only one that was positive. And if I remember correctly, in this particular case that was in Lancet, um, the infant itself was not infected. Um, so I think that just having virus in the milk, just like having virus in the stool, doesn't necessarily mean the virus is infectious. So I think um, particularly in low and middle income countries where breastfeeding is so important for survival, uh, I wouldn't change the recommendations that we currently have. Thank you very much. And one last question from Priscilla. Would you recommend a family-centered approach to testing for COVID to include children if one family member is diagnosed? Absolutely. I yes. think that's, a, that's, a, that's standard contact tracing. Uh, and maybe one final question from Tracy before we move on to the next presenters. Would you recommend a four week follow up of asymptomatic COVID confirmed children in light of evolving information on the multi inflammatory syndrome? Does it, does it change the way in which we look at or think about children who we've previously felt are not at risk or at low risk or likely to be asymptomatic? Yeah, I think, I think this is not just true for children, but for adults as well, because there have been asymptomatic cases that a week or two later um, have deterioration and get sick. So yes, I would recommend follow-up. It doesn't have to necessarily be in person. It could be telephone uh, follow-up, mm -hmm. but I would recommend follow-up even if there were no symptoms. So more Zoom calls for all people with uh, COVID <laughs> out there who are, who are asymptomatic. Lynn, thank you very, very much. Colleagues, if there are more questions, uh, please do write them in the chat. We will have an opportunity to come back to questions for Lynn um, at the end of the webinars. But in the interest of time, I'd like to move on now and hand back to Rike for the next presentation. Thanks, Shafiq, and, and thanks, Lynn, again. Um, I'd now like to introduce our next trio of speakers. Uh, we have Maria Vivas Alicea, who is HIV AIDS specialist at UNICEF Lesotho, and she will present adaptations in delivery of HIV sensitive programming together with Shatrak Mutembe, 
who is the country director of Help Lesotho, and Shasha Mahkauta, who is their youth and gender coordinator. So Maria, over to you. Great, thank you so much. So yeah, so um, Shadrach, uh, Shasha and I will be talking about the adaptations that we did to the Lesotho Young Mothers Program to, be, to respond to COVID-19. So this is what we will be talking to you about today, but in the interest of time, we'll go right into the content. So the Young Mothers Program is an activity under Together for SRHR, a four-year joint UN regional program funded by the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency that aims to strengthen integrated SRHR, HIV, and SGBV services in East and Southern Africa. The Young Mothers Program aims to improve the health and HIV outcomes of pregnant and breastfeeding adolescent girls and young women and their children using peer-to-peer -peer mentorship as the main approach to achieving results. Through peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, the young mothers will be empowered to access health services and empower communities to support their needs. The program is also generating evidence to advocate action on adolescent mothers' issues. So I'll now take you through the interventions theory of change. Adolescent girls and young women in Lesotho face underlying issues that put them at higher risk of HIV, such as low comprehensive knowledge of HIV and high HIV incidence. To tackle these issues, the Young Mothers Program hinges on evidence generation, C4D, adolescent participation, and cross-sectoral linkages to achieve the desired results. The Young Mothers Program focuses on strengthening the community facility linkage. At the facility level, the young mothers are trained monthly on topics around SRHR, HIV, SWB, mental health, ECD, and this is just to name a few. And they're empowered to invite their partners and mother-in-laws for the trainings. They're also supported with psychosocial support and receive monthly wellness checks for themselves and their children. All this is done with the health center staff to support sustainability. Special linkages are made at district level with the line ministries to support the young mother's access to other social services, such as birth registration and long distance education. At the community level, the young mothers reach other young mothers in their communities with the information they receive at the facility through the village support groups. And really the village support groups are the basis of the program. And this is where the young mothers support other young mothers and collectively find solutions to community issues affecting them. Additionally, the young mothers conduct community dialogues, health education, along with the village health worker, and create linkages with the village leaders for action on issues affecting them. The young mothers also receive social protection starter packs. So the intervention is expected to empower young mothers and improve their knowledge on sexual reproductive health rights, improve the knowledge of their partners and caregivers, and enable communities to support the needs of the young mothers. Ultimately, through stakeholder and partner contributions, it will contribute to health systems being more responsive to the needs of the young mothers, improved quality of health services adapted to young mothers, and improved health seeking and positive health practices among the young mothers. It will also contribute to partners, caregivers, and community leaders having an increased understanding of the needs of young mothers and their children. This will lead to pregnant and breastfeeding adolescent girls and young women and their children having improved health and HIV outcomes. So Lesotho was in an emergency preparedness phase until the 13th of May, when the first confirmed COVID-19 case was announced. And in preparation, the government of Lesotho imposed a three-week lockdown starting in April, where only essential services were to be provided. As a response, on the 6th of April, the Ministry of Health announced the cancellation of all community-level C4D interventions, including health education, demand generation, and community outreach. As of today, all community level interventions remain canceled. As such, all community level interventions of the Young Mothers Program were canceled. And this is where really Help Lesotho and UNICEF had to adapt the approach. We're currently implementing the short term adaptations, but here we present our medium term and long term plans. Our adaptations are aligned to the guidance provided by UNICEF ISARO on HIV programming in the context of COVID 19, mainly continuity of services prevention and protection for people at risk or living with HIV, and research and documentation. So in the short term, we're concentrating on continuity of services and prevention. We're providing remote psychosocial, psychosocial support, health education around COVID-19 and sexual reproductive health and HIV, 
and providing wellness checks through a simplified questionnaire looking at food insecurity, HIV, MNCH, and SRH. All this is being done through WhatsApp, phone calls, and SMS. Those young mothers identified as high risk are then referred to the health center through the village health worker. Post lockdown and when the government allows, we plan on providing PPE for village support groups. We'll continue to uh, provide health information and linking it to your report, uh, provide outreach in small groups to identify young mothers laws to follow up and engage in community dialogues with partners and mother-in-laws. We will also be strengthening the linkages with education and social protection. Finally, in the recovery phase, we will concentrate on documenting COVID-19 and SRHR HIV linkages and provide remote psychosocial su support to those interested young mothers and link with the child helpline. Now over to Shadrach for the implementing partners' perspectives. Helplessitu is directly implementing the Adolescent Mothers Program that is supported by UNICEF. And a month before the Lesotho uh, lockdown, we started preparing guidelines document on COVID-19 uh, to ensure that staff members were guided and also our programming were continuing adapting to COVID-19. We trained our staff members uh, on COVID-19 and we ensured that they under the fact on COVID-19 and that themselves were psychologically prepared and they had the scientific information and confidence to support uh, adolescent uh, mothers remotely during the lockdown. Uh, during the lockdown, our staff, our program staff worked from home uh, while we supported them to ensure that uh, the challenges and concerns that were coming from, their, from the programming uh, remotely were being addressed appropriately and uh, uh, timely. I'm pleased to uh, report that we successfully reached about 167 adolescent mothers and their children out of uh, 318 adolescent mothers. Our initial assessment before our intervention revealed that there was a lot of myths about COVID-19 in Lesotho. And remember, we are working with the young mothers who are living in remote and to reach areas. And some of the myths were like the, uh, the COVID-19 is for the white persons and, 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 not, um, and that a black person cannot uh, be infected by COVID-19. And also uh, other myths included uh, placing an onion in your house can prevent you from being infected by uh, COVID-19. So the provision of remote health counseling, uh, COVID-19 uh, information and psychological support uh, to these adolescent mothers uh, was very helpful and timely uh, to ensure that um, those needs uh, were addressed and that they had to fact uh, to protect uh, themselves and others. And we do have uh, lessons learned so far uh, uh, that I would like to present in the next slide. Shasha was, uh, will continue with the lessons learned so far. Shasha, you are on mute. Thank you. I will continue the lesson learned so far. We have been doing referrals. While the health centers continued providing services, young mothers were not aware, some were afraid, uh, were not aware that the services are still continue in the health centers. So through our calls, we made referrals through the village health workers which were very important to provide on continuity of services to ensure adherence to key services such as contraceptives, HIV services, immunization, nutrition and counseling. Also on the community levels, we normally have our village support groups 
which are very important for our Young Mother Support Network. It is essential to continue discussing issues remotely. Young mothers mostly living in the remote and hard to reach areas had little and myths about COVID-19, which caused them anxiety and stress. So they felt relaxed and revived after receiving the facts about COVID-19 through the calls that we made. Therefore, they were able to protect themselves and others. I'll uh, invite the teacher track to say more on the program implementation. Thank you. Another lesson learned on program implementation is during our initial assessment, uh, it was uh, reviewed that approximately 60% of the young mothers had access to, to cell phones. So we began to encourage them to share the information on COVID-19 with their neighboring young mothers. Uh, other times uh, we were able to get um, uh, young mothers from uh, the same village uh, in a small group uh, where they were able to uh, learn information uh, and receive uh, psychological support uh, through phones on, on loudspeakers to cater for those without cell phones. Thank you. Thank you um, to all three of you. Um, Maria, did you have any closing remarks? Uh, no, uh, not really. Just to acknowledge uh, the Lesotho's Ministry of Health for its leadership um, and really acknowledge the contribution of Lesotho uh, towards the implementation of the program. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it's really great to see how HIV as an integrated pillar of a cross-cutting program is maintained as, as a key consideration. Uh, so we will now take a look at adaptations of an HIV-specific program in Uganda. And our next speaker to provide that overview is Moses Buide, who is the founder and executive director of Peer to Peer Uganda. He's a 30-year-old youth leader and advocate that has led Peru to grow from a community youth club with 13 members back in 2015 to now a national youth-driven NGO, reaching over 3 million Ugandan youth with its integrated SRHR, HIV, and TB programming. So I'd like to hand over to you, Moses, to upload your presentation and um, take over. Yes, thank you very much. I'm uh, trying to load my presentation here. Hello, everyone. Greetings to you. Okay. So are we all able to see my presentation? Um, you are, no, we are seeing a Word document. A Word document, wow, okay. Oh. Hang on, I have your slides here, so you can just tell me um, next slide. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yes, um, this is the presentation that I'm going to make. It's not quite a long one. Uh, I'll be going through it quite very fast because I don't have a lot of time on my side. I was allocated 10 minutes. I hope I play within that. Uh, so to move to my first uh, slide of the presentation, uh, let's move to the next slide. Okay. Uh, First, hold on, let's hold on a little bit. Yes, so currently, uh, what is the situation in Uganda? Uh, the situation in Uganda is a little bit uh, quite very funny, uh, but I think to give you further background about myself, uh, like how Ricky said, I, I work with an institution called Peer to Peer Uganda. Uh, we are based in Kampala but we are working across the country, doing a couple of things, uh, a lot of work around uh, integrated sexual reproductive health, HIV, and, uh, and TB programming. 
And uh, we have been running a couple of interventions around HIV with young people living uh, and most vulnerable to HIV. But during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in Uganda, uh, it became a little bit complicated for us to continue doing the kind of work we have been doing uh, previously uh, because of a number of uh, reasons where we, we ended up in lockdown and uh, what has been some of our uh, the COVID-19 impact in our, in our country uh, as a whole. One, there has been a disruption in primary health care. Uh, the access uh, to, to health facilities has been very difficult, uh, uh, among, among other issues uh, which has uh, crippled a lot of uh, results that we had been already, we had already achieved as, uh, as stakeholders uh, in terms of uh, making sure that we, we improve uh, and contribute to the better lives of young people. Uh, then also, the community cannot uh, travel to the health facilities. Here, uh, when the moment we got into a lockdown, the biggest population in Uganda does not own private cars. So most of them use public means. That's what we call the taxis, which is a 14-person seater, and, uh, and then the border borders, which are motorbikes. Now, we, you find that we reached a moment where many young people cannot, cannot access the health facilities you know, to, to be able to go and access uh, the services that they need, including uh, refills of their ARVs or go to, to the health facilities to, 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 know, to know about their HIV status or even be able to go and access the other sexual reproductive health commodities uh, that they may need, including family planning options, uh, self-delivery, antenatal care, among others. Now, we have, been in, we have been in a lockdown for over two months. And in a country that survives on, on daily income, where about 70% about of the population survives on daily income, things become quite very complicated. And, uh, and this has left us in a very, very difficult situation uh, because, like I said, many people cannot access ART services, cannot access uh, the SRH services they need, uh, among, among all the others. Schools were the first measure that was put forward by the president to be closed. So the, the schools were closed. Up to now, uh, schools haven't been opened yet. Uh, there has been a lot of gender-based violence. Remember, most of the population in Uganda are poor people. And, uh, and one of the major drivers for, uh, for domestic gender-based violence in, uh, and domestic violence in, in my country is, is poverty. You know, uh, people, because they survive on daily income, uh, food insecurity has been on a rise. Uh, so literally there has been a lot going on in my country, people struggling here and there to make ends meet. But uh, we, 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 we tried to reach out to, to a couple of partners and luckily enough, uh, Pata came on board and, and started to support us uh, in terms of uh, through the, the emergency fund uh, to help us bridge some of these gaps. But then also the other major factor that has frustrated uh, the, the health sector in our country in general is uh, the busting of the shorelines of, of Lake Victoria, which is the biggest uh, lake we have around, uh, even in Africa. Uh, you find that the biggest population of uh, young people living with HIV uh, is within uh, major towns and then also the fishing community. That is along Lake Victoria, Lake Albert, and Lake Choga. Now, all these other lakes are feeding off Lake Victoria, and now, Currently, the water levels of Lake Victoria have risen to about 13.4 meters, which is way, way above what has ever happened in over 60 years in this country. So the migration of so many people has left many untraceable in terms of those who would be able to reach with home visits and the likes. Let's proceed to the next slide. So what has Peru been doing to, to address some of those gaps that I've been saying? Uh, one, we have uh, continued uh, and further intensified our, uh, our programming around community peer leaders, where we have continued to mobilize our, our, 
community peer leaders because they are our backbone. As an, as an institution, our power is in the community, not in our office. So we have further continued to mobilize our community peers, sensitize them, oriented them on, on, on the use of technology. How do you use technology? How do you understand Zoom? How can we continue to do follow-ups using that kind of approach? And, and furthermore, we have gone ahead to do community sensitization, awareness creation, to make things happen. Then also we went ahead to develop and distribute uh, targeted COVID-19 IEC materials. Uh, these have been developed by our very technical team, but through making sure that we were directly tapping into the, the globally and nationally approved COVID-19 IEC materials. Uh, that is the um, WHO standards and then the Ministry of Health uh, standards. And uh, we went ahead and interpreted uh, translated some of this content into the local languages where we, we, we have been disseminating most of this content online on social media, but also printed hard copies that we disseminated to our communities. Uh, we have also continued, you know, to do a lot of uh, awareness creation on, on, on good hygiene practices for infection control. Um, where we are making sure that there is a lot of disinfection. What are the benefits of, uh, of having uh, uh, being hygienically clean as an individual, having an, a hygienically clean environment and the likes, uh, so that we're able to, you know, to cut the cycle on, uh, on the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we further went ahead to, to purchase uh, PPP, PPE, uh, IEC uh, uh, protective gear. Uh, that is the face mask, gloves, and then the sanitizers. Uh, which we, we equipped with our community peer leaders to, to be able to be protected as they're doing their work in communities. Because uh, as an institution, we run on policies and uh, we run around some of our policies, the, the, risk manage, uh, the risk management policy, which clearly talks about the safeguarding of our, you know, of our staff and, and support, uh, support human resource. So, uh, through the fund, the, the emergency fund by Pata, we were able to purchase some of these, these materials. Uh, and and, and we, we gave out to over 1,000 uh, community peers. Uh, but also, again, we went ahead and, and, and engaged in discussions with the health in charges at the facilities where uh, most of our young people are attached, who are, you know, attached to the youth corners, uh, at these health facilities and the, at the ART clinics and sometimes at the, at the OPD uh, to make sure that at least, you know, these young people are accessing um, their ARVs. They're able to be given uh, treatment that goes beyond the three months, sometimes even six months. Remember, this is a paper, a paper strategy that was put forward. So we're lucky that uh, some facilities uh, accepted that request and uh, and we have been able to work through our community peers uh, doing the the home visits to deliver some of these uh, air arrangements and refills for the access the health facilities that are quite very far from them uh, then also went ahead to do a lot of integrated SRHR and HIV online campaign uh, through coming up with all these amazing visuals, some that I talked about earlier that we printed, and you're going to see in my next slide, you will see some of the content that I'm talking about here. So through also continuing to use a lot of online engagement, we, we, we went ahead to do a lot of peer support and follow-ups. So do we, using, using, using online engagements through our social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts, and, uh, and also our official website link, uh, we have been able to continue to engage our young people uh, through, you know, through these platforms so that they send in their questions, we give them responses. When they need emergency helplines, we are able to provide them with those emergency helplines so that they are able to call the toll free lines and seek further guidance and support they need that is beyond us. Uh, in communities where young people cannot access smartphones, we went ahead and started to, to make direct phone calls through loading airtime on, on, on mobile phones of our community peers and them being able to use the airtime to, to, to help make the follow-ups for, in order to, 
to promote um, uh, ad adherence and also provide a lot of psychosocial support. Next slide. Um, Moses, just to let you know that we're at 11 minutes, so if you could try and, and summarize a bit. Yes, yeah, so this is thank you. Thank you. So this is some of the content uh, that we have been able to to develop. Uh, you get to see that it's talking about a couple of a couple of content that is cross cutting uh, from family unit to pregnancy and beyond, and then the protective care over there and the likes. Uh, these are some of the materials that we developed, but we have more uh, that we could be able to share. You could visit our website, uh, peer to peer Uganda website, under resources and access them. Next slide. Could we have the next slide? Yes, so now these are, okay. Uh, the previous slide a little bit. Could you have the previous slide? Yes, yeah, so this slide is just uh, showing you some of the photos of what happens in the communities and how we're engaging uh, the communities to make sure that we are rich. So let's move forward. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, the previous one. Okay, so this is my final slide. Uh, on this slide, we are talking about the advice, the advice for innovations and adaptations. What are some of the things that uh, maybe a, a different patterns could be able to take on and and and, and use? One is. Uh, uh, MMD, ART and delivery to patients is something that we felt is very important that uh, different partners uh, through working with their community peers and also their support systems could be able to, to work with the health facilities and make sure that some of their young people who want ART treatment are able to get, uh, you know, their refills for, for, for a longer time before they can come back to the health facilities. The next. Okay, so information sharing online uh, increases a lot of uh, previous uh, increase, increasing levels of community awareness. Uh, it's quite very cost effective. It's something that you can do uh, to address so many issues using the different platforms. Uh, peer support online uh, is something that is very unique. Uh, however, you need to heavily invest in improving the, the knowledge of, uh, of the community uh, of the peers. Uh, of your communication team at the institution that supports uh, and provides the information so that the right information is shared. Then finally, they need to involve young people in the national and the district level COVID-19 task forces. In my country, Uganda, the task force has no young person or even a person below 35 years. Now, you cannot tell me that a country that is talking about 78% of the population below 30 years and you don't have anyone below 35 years who is serving on, the, on, on, on such committees. So it's important to have such committees have also young people involved. Uh, then finally, I want to take this opportunity to say thank you very much to the different partners uh, that have made it happen for us. Our partner, our backbone in this, in this work, uh, we appreciate um, the, the, the hard work that you are putting to make sure to make sure things happen and then UNICEF. Uh, thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Moses. Um, most of our questions for um, these two programmatic sessions have already been answered in, in the Q&A box and we're running a little bit behind. So I'll just move on to our last speaker. Uh, but before presenting her, um, and she will be speaking about the frontline perspectives, I would like to set the stage by showing a video that was produced by PATA, which takes us inside health facilities and gives voice to some of the frontline providers. Just a note that it was put together by some members in the PATA network at very short notice. And some of the pictures will present more of life before lockdown, while others will be speaking to the changing realities that we are seeing at present. Um, share computers. What we have experienced the changes during this period, we have cuts at the facility. These cuts are working at home. They're using their phone to track, they're using the SMS, even the WhatsApp. 
the big numbers which were coming on daily basis for clinical appointments have reduced from 500 to less than 200. So discussions and the health, health talks, group talks and, and, and meetings of young people according to their age has been reduced because of this problem. We no longer do triage, we no longer do face-to-face -face interactions, we no longer do counseling. There is increase of gender-based violence. Uh, we have difficulty to travel due to, local, to the lockdown. Growth monitoring is not taking place. Those that are coming for win are not being done from the facility, but from the, the community. From these cases, we've had uh, seven deaths from the time that the disease started. And also, we've had also a number of health workers that uh, have been affected. And if you are a healthcare worker on those hospitals, most people don't want to meet you. They feel like you already have the virus. And um, even your family, they get, get scared of you. So you're kind of being um, isolated. So when they come in and they go out, it's like, a, it stresses them. People are afraid to go home. People are afraid to come in. And uh, they really don't know what to do. The challenges in this clinic at the moment is the big number of the clients are not able to reach to the clinic as a result of country lockdown, which saw public means of transport being prohibited. One of the challenges that most of the people here uh, stay very far from the clinic. Some have to walk an hour from their place to the clinic and they don't have bicycles, they don't have any mode of transport, they have to walk. So you find that by the time they reach the clinic, they are very tired, some will even miss appointments. So the clinic is experiencing difficulties to reach the clients. They are trying as much as they can to make the phone calls, to do the follow-up through the, the community structures, but it's very complex. What are some of the innovations they have come up with? They have come up with small models of drug deliveries to homes and also to designated points. All the clients must consent to avoid stigma and discrimination when they are receiving their drugs in areas of their choice. On the package of the drugs, there is a phone number which is well known by this particular client. They can call and they will receive services. And even here at the clinic, we have few benches. So each bench seats two people. So if they are more than 100 maybe, some will remain outside. Our clients, those that are stable have been supplied with the drug pickups that the era is for six months. My advice um, to healthcare provider, to other healthcare provider is be able to talk. Don't let things inside you, eating you inside you, and all this distress. Um, find a psychologist or a friend or anyone using a WhatsApp platform, um, uh, Instagram, any, any social media. Thank you so much. I believe your support has helped us to reach many, many young people. Stay home and stay safe. Okay, I would now like to introduce our last speaker, who is Dr. Violet Nabate. Um, and hang on, let me. Um, who's a pediatrician currently working as head of pediatric and adolescent services at Mild May Uganda Hospital, where she offers technical support as a team leader working with clinicians, counselors, social workers, and nurses. She's also a member of the Pediatric Adolescent Treatment Africa or PATA Action Network of Frontline Health Providers, 
who put this video together. And one moment and we will have her slides up and running. Okay, over to you, Violet. Thank you very much, Rike. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you for welcoming me to this webinar, and I'll straight away go to the results of the survey that was done by Pata on COVID-19. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, the rationale for this survey was because there was a lot of uncertainty about how COVID-19 will affect essential health services, especially given high burdens of disease with HIV, TB, and malaria. And the objectives were for us to be able to better understand critical gaps and needs in COVID-19 response and possible impacts on the HIV service delivery and to amplify the voices of health providers across Sub-Saharan Africa, highlighting their reality and prioritizing areas of support needed to fight the pandemic. Next slide. Uh, we had a total of 188 respondents from 17 countries, and most of the responders were from East and Southern Africa. Majority of the respondents were involved with providing services, care, or programming for children, adolescents, and young people living with HIV. And 49% of respondents were involved in clinical roles, especially that is as doctors, nurses, midwives, or counselors. And this group is what we refer to as health providers. Next slide. Uh, where the, pro the respondents were located, uh, we had 39% uh, uh, being uh, deployed at the primary level, and then we have 19% at the tertiary and 42% at the secondary level. But we also realized that most of these um, health facilities, uh, we have 25% located in the rural areas, and then 25% peri-urban and 50% very uh, quite urban. And it's very important for us to note that most of the respondents were really at the front line, that is at the primary level and secondary levels as compared to the tertiary. Next slide. Uh, how do we prepare for COVID-19? Of all the 188 respondents, 15% said that they did not have access to information that is reliable, helpful, and practical and 70% cited needing more information. So because COVID-19 was a new thing that had just come in, everyone was yearning for more information. And by the time this survey was done, a certain majority had not received this information as yet. And similarly, respondents identified their community's most pressing need as access to information and awareness on COVID-19 on how to keep themselves safe and healthy. Of course, this comes amidst the different myths. For example, someone mentioned using onions in the house to be able to trap the virus. So they really needed up-to-date information. And respondents overwhelmingly cited the need for more information and training on COVID-19. Next slide. The information that was required, when we look at the percentages from 60 to 93%, what information did these respondents want? How to treat and care for someone with COVID-19 was at the highest because we expected that we're going to get these cases of this disease. So we needed to know how to treat and care for them. How to support colleagues and patients that show signs of distress and anxiety. Of course, there was a lot of anxiety that came in as a result of this new disease. Then how to identify and diagnose someone with COVID-19, how to manage routine services, because we were worried that our routine services were going to be disrupted anyway and how COVID-19 is affecting the country and region, and how to keep myself and my family safe from COVID-19 was very key, because as a health worker, you interact with family and go to the clinic. So at the end of the day, we are the ones who carry infection to our families, and we needed information on how to keep safe. Next slide. These are some of the voices that came up from these health workers as they looked at treating and caring for COVID-19 patients. A community worker from Zambia was concerned about the impact that COVID-19 has on those who are living or personally affected with HIV AIDS. Of course, this comes with a background of the severity of disease occurring in those who are immune suppressed, hence the need to know how it is going to impact on people who are living with HIV and AIDS. And then when we look at managing other routine services during COVID-19, a peer supporter from Uganda had queries of what should I tell my peers to do 
when the appointment dates come because there's no transport. Everyone has talked about a lockdown in their country. So how are our clients expected to move into to receive service delivery at the health facilities? It was such a big challenge. And then when it came to keeping myself and my family safe from COVID-19, how to live with a person who recovered from the disease and came back to the family. I'll just um, allude to Minister of Health Uganda. They go out and sensitize the community before they discharge a patient. But we have noted that even when a patient is discharged, it is very difficult for them to fit in the family because the stigma is still there. They are looked at as an infection that is still ongoing. And some of them have actually failed to live in the community where they came from and they have to seek refuge elsewhere, probably maybe until COVID-19 ends. Next slide. Uh, looking at our systems and the SOPs, 24% of respondents reported that their facilities did not have any protocols or clinical standard operating procedures related to COVID-19. Again, this was an early phase looking at COVID-19 and 55% reported to be needing more. So some level had a bit of SOPs, but they needed more concerning COVID-19. And this was part of the information that was required to be given as an add-on to what they had. Then regarding protocols and clinical SOPs for infection prevention and control to ensure health and safety. 22% of respondents reported having none at their facilities and 60% needing more. Remember, most of our respondents came from the primary health facility and secondary, and these are the ones that are closest to the community, but also their level of documenting protocols and clinical SOPs is a bit on the lower side when you compare with the tertiary, where it's much broader and their SOPs are in place almost all the time. And 22% of all respondents reported that their facilities had no systems for managing physical distancing in their facilities. We will find that uh, there are facilities where the land where the facility is located is quite limited, that you cannot even space out people. So it was a big challenge for social distancing. Next slide. Um, this graph simply points us to the protocols and SOPs on infection prevention and control for health facility and staff. You just look at uh, what we have as we don't have this at all and we need more. So it's really a big outcry that came out from the survey. What did we have? They never had anything and that was a big percentage and they also needed more. So when you look at we have enough, the percentages are really small for those that had enough. So there's still a big need for us to acquire the protocols and SOPs. Next slide. Uh, looking at protocols and clinical SOPs related to COVID-19, we need more, scored the highest at 61, 59, 48, and 55. And there are those who didn't have any at all. So a lot of work to date has been put um, in ensuring that we get these protocols and clinical SOPs because we actually realized COVID-19 was not anywhere in the picture. So we wouldn't even have the protocols or SOPs. But now, because we needed more, most of these countries have been able to put up uh, several of these SOPs. Next slide. Uh, before COVID-19, where were we spending most of our time? The program manager from Zimbabwe mentioned that most of their time was spent providing health education and counseling for children and young people living with HIV on COVID-19 and adherence. But looking at um, the lockdown coming in, would you spend more hours doing that? So that was a challenge that after spending these long hours, it was never going to happen and this would be a critical impact on the service delivery. Then a midwife from Cote d'Ivoire told us that planning work schedules for personnel in, my, in her department, encouraging pregnant women, patients to show at appointments and take their ARVs, took up a lot of time. But now you realize that almost everybody had to get onto fast track. Case in point, Uganda at Mile May, we had to ensure that patients were fast tracked. For those who were able to make it to the hospital, as soon as they came in, you spent minimal time, picked your drugs and then moved off. So planning schedules had to stop. And then responding to emergency plans for children focusing more on mental health issues and protection from abuse. We realized that there was going to be a higher probability in confined spaces during lockdown, but where would we spend the time given the lockdown? So all these were concerns of how we would spend the time that was presented in this survey. Next slide. Uh, we looked at psychosocial support and stress in this survey, and we actually realized that 96% of the respondents were stressed. 
an extremely stressed score at 26% and very stressed score at 27%. So because of the uncertainty, everyone was thinking, how do we run the system? How are we going to manage COVID? We don't have supplies, we don't have PPE, and all these created stresses, especially in addition to having the lockdown. So everyone needed support. Next slide. What were the stressors at individual level? The risk of being infected with COVID-19 while caring for others, and this is a big risk for all of the health providers because we are the ones who carry infection from work to home and this is a very big stressor for i for example have young children at home but every time i left home and went to the hospital they asked mommy are you going to be safe as you go and when i came back someone was ready to give me sanitizer and say mommy don't touch us just go to your room and clean up so it's really such a big challenge and stressed many people and until now it is happening especially given the challenges of ppe a uh, part of community if it strikes in our community of operation would people really survive? We know what our health systems are made of. So people are concerned that if this disease is killing many people in the Western countries, what if it comes to our local community, would we survive? Point of concern and in the systems, how COVID-19 is affecting the daily life of citizens. Everyone will attest to this, that their daily lives have been affected with the lockdown. Next slide. What resources do we need? Uh, when we look at resources for diagnosis, we need more and we don't have any at all. So COVID-19 testing kits, drugs to treat, respiratory support, and supplies for supportive care were all lacking. And resources to prevent, again, we realized that we needed more of sanitizer, needed more hand washing supplies, needed PPE. But you will notice that as the trend has moved on after this survey, these needs have been put in place and most of the health facilities have been able to acquire a bit of these needs and they have gotten them sorted. Next slide. Systems and infrastructure. Uh, social distancing was very key and people needed to have this. Triaging patients, that system also needed to work. Needing additional staff, space and beds, all these are actual needs as we run the health service delivery and this came out critically in the survey and other resources, three to six month ARVs or chronic medications. Remember, I mentioned our point of needing to fast track these patients and we needed to give them long appointments to keep them in their homes. Remember, stay home, stay safe. So if you said you are going to give them a six month supply of ARVs, we would not have planned much earlier for that. So the supply would run out for the next patient. And then other chronic uh, drugs, including ARVs and essential drugs, all this was still a need for most of the respondents. Next slide. Uh, what are the key takeaway messages for us that came out from this survey? Primary and secondary health facilities were less prepared for COVID-19 and they were less able to continue essential HIV services. Again, I'll just give an example because working at Maidme Uganda, we are doing a lot of HIV services among others, but we're also struck because we have 16,000 patients to take care of. And then we're looking at how are we giving them HIV services quickly. We have adopted a courier system where clients call in and have their drugs delivered to them. Our staff are carrying medicines for some patients. I personally carry some on my way home and deliver to clients who are on my way as I get home. And then we have had one peer coming and picking for about 10 uh, of their peers and they take those drugs. But we have also made use of the community drug distribution points where we phone call patients and then they come to a particular place to pick their drugs. They're also using the toll-free line very well. And some of them have been advised to pick their ARVs from the nearest facilities, have this documented, and then communicated to our systems. Now, the reasons that these primary and secondary facilities were less prepared is there was less access to information and training. There was a high level of stress and with several stressors and high needs for a variety of resources, last but not least health providers will be affected as the pandemic takes hold in Africa, and we need more data on health worker infections and deaths. Our call to action is all frontline health providers need some level of preparation, support, and additional resources to respond to COVID-19, as well as continuing essential HIV service delivery. Next slide. Thank you all to Pata. Thank you to everybody that participated in this survey as you realize every voice counts and nothing for us without frontline health providers. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Ricky.
Thank you, Violet. These were really, really interesting insights into what is going on um, on the front line and what health service providers are experiencing and reporting. We now have a few minutes left for um, open questions on the Q&A. So I will hand over the floor to Shafiq again for his moderation. Thank you very much, Rike, and thanks again, colleagues. Uh, unfortunately, we went a little over time with this webinar, and um, so we may not have a chance to get through all of the questions. Um, but the first question comes from Carmela, who's asking if anybody knows of an app for smartphones that is specifically targeted at adolescents and that provides advice and information on the uh, on on COVID nineteen that's relevant to the Africa context. Do we have any quick answers from the panelists on whether anybody has seen an app? No, I haven't seen any as yet. Thank you, thank you, Moses. Uh, Carmela, it sounds like you have to go and, and, and create one, but uh, that, that will be an interesting niche to fill. Um, we also have a, a question from Dr. Monique uh, who is asking, and again, this question is, is for Maria, Shadrach, Shasha, and, and Moses. Um, due to lockdown conditions, did information shared with program consumers also include a presumed positive infection um, at the health facility level? Uh, 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 Rike, I think, I think you're planning to answer this question. Please go ahead. Sorry, Shafi, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. Due to lockdown conditions, did information shared with program consumers also include information regarding presumed positive and COVID infection control? Um, I'm not sure I'm the right person to, to answer this. I would like to hand over to our, our panel. Yes, uh, sorry, I apologize. It says Rike would like to answer this question live on the uh, Yes, no, just indicating that um, we would like to answer this live and not in, in writing. Got it, got it, yes. So if the question is asking, if I understand it correctly, um, if we're giving information of if you think, if you have symptoms, um, do this, then yes, that information was given. Uh, on infection control, yes, a lot of the um, messaging uh, was developed by the Ministry of Health and the uh, risk, uh, risk Communication Community Engagement Technical Working Group um, at a national level and was disseminated to partners. So while that information was um, disseminated uh, and, and given to the Young Mothers, but also beyond the Young Mothers program, through radio programs, um, a, a WhatsApp chat box, and different community level um, channels as well. So I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Dr. Monique, if you have further clarifications, please do type them into the chat box. Um, uh, uh, Anwar um, uh, notes for Moses that uh, he highly appreciates your efforts with Peru and wishes the best and wants to understand how, as you're interacting with young individuals on ART adherence, if you can suggest some of the strategies that you're following, Moses, in ensuring that uh, in the current situation, young people on ART are remaining adherent to their drugs. Any specific tips that you can provide from your experience, Moses, to really help support ART adherence amongst young people in this time? Moses, uh, you need to unmute yourself if you want to respond. Okay, as we wait for Moses to uh, understand how to do, uh, uh, to, 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 to get back online, um, I, I, I wanted to ask a question uh, to uh, Violet uh, that's coming in from Reverend Jacob, um, who notes that he noted that most of the agencies of the participants in the survey that wanted more SOPs were people that came from tertiary centers, and yet earlier they wanted more PPE. 
So he's just wondering if the primary level facilities understood the uh, 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 need for SOPs as well as the others. Any thoughts on, on, on that question, Violet? Thank you very much, Reverend Jacob. Now, as you will notice, it's higher chances that the people at the tertiary level understand the SOP and PPE. And um, most of the time they have the SOPs, yes, because their responses were yes, they had them, but they lacked a bit of the SOPs on COVID-19, so they wanted more of those. But the responses for SOPs for the primary level is this is a level that rarely has that language because given the cadres of staff that operate there. So it's no wonder that they also end up needing more of the SOP because they actually do not have any. I hope that clarifies it a bit, Reverend Jacob. Got it, thank you very much, Violet. Moses, I see you've now unmuted. Uh, please, yeah. can you answer Anwar's question about any specific tips to help young people remain adherent in the current time of COVID? Uh, one is uh, doing a lot of peer-to-peer uh, -peer follow ups you know, making sure that you're trying to understand through the phone calls, trying to understand how is this young person living, if they are facing any, any, any challenges, which, which other young person within the, the community that they are living in, uh, who is also living with HIV, is able to be reached out to so that they're able to move towards the others and they meet and be able to interact further. So it's more like you're tapping into the other person's adherence levels so that you're able to also cope. So we are investing more into the peer-to-peer -peer model uh, because it seems to be, it's what is working for us and it has been working and it's what we are trying to continue to retain even during mm -hmm. this period of time. Uh, thank you very much, Moses. That's very helpful. Um, by the way, I've just been told that the Pata Ready program is actually in the process of developing an app for adolescents. So, um, Carmela, perhaps you don't need to develop your own. And please follow up with us offline so that we can connect you with more information on that adolescent app um, as it becomes available. Maybe a couple, a couple more questions. Uh, again, directed at our colleague, uh, at our colleagues from um, um, from Uganda, Moses especially, and our yes. colleagues from from Lesotho. You talked, Moses, about the multi-month prescribing that was that was going on. Now we yes. had a couple of uh, additional questions on on that um, that I'm just going to read out to you. The, the first yes. is, you know, is the PEPFAR supply chain? for ARVs also integrated with this. And as far as you know, apart from the young people in your program, are other clients in the country able to access um, six months of ARVs based on, on national guidelines? Um, and then a related question that I wanted to ask you is, talking about multi-month prescribing, how are you making sure or what conversations are happening about the ongoing availability of drugs and supplies of antiretrovirals in the context of you know, limited transportation, limited flights coming in, bringing these commodities, and also limited production capacity from generic manufacturers. If you have any information on that, um, that would be very helpful. Um, and uh, the, the final question was, uh, you know, might home visits for delivery of drugs also provide an opportunity for observation in the home to detect issues with, for example, stigma or gender-based violence that might be related to HIV and or COVID? That question comes from Corrine Whitaker. So um, over to you, Moses, for uh, some answers on those quick questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, on, uh, on the PEPFA MMD, uh, we have it integrated into the national supply chain, and, but that is on paper, that is on paper. Uh, however, currently, we haven't really had people get uh, their refills up to six months as yet. 
So what is still running around the facilities is three months. And this is because of a number of, uh, a number of issues. Some of the health service providers are, are still hesitant to, to implement the six months because some people are still a little bit reckless in terms of monitoring their own health uh, when they are taking their treatment without having a third party to or, or a health provider continue to, to, to look out for them. So we are still working around the three months and that's what we have been running on. Uh, but it's a, it has already been uh, integrated into the national supply chain. Then the second question, I, I haven't got enough information on the second question that you've asked. Uh -huh. uh, uh, but I, I think I'm yet to find out more on that. The yeah. third question, I, it, it came from who? Uh, the third question was from our colleague, uh, 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 Corrine Whitaker, who's basically asking oh. if in the context of you going to visit homes uh, to deliver medication, is there an opportunity there to talk about other issues that might be coming up uh, in relation to uh, COVID or stigma or fear or violence in the home? Uh, how are you using that as an opportunity to probe more deeply or to provide additional types of information? Yes, so now, as, as, as peer to peer Uganda, we, one, first and foremost, we are an organization that is not having quite a lot of money to make things happen. However much we have all these amazing ideas. So what we do is we integrate most of our activities to use to use one opportunity to hit more than three birds at the same time. So we equip most of our you know, community peer leaders when they're going to do this home visit, you are going first and foremost to go and try to further understand, mm. are there any other issues that this young person is facing beyond HIV? You know, that's why you see for us, our work is around integrated sexual reproductive health and HIV programming. So even the IEC materials we are developing right now are all talking about integration at the moment. Uh, because when you go to the home, you need to talk about those issues. If there, is, there are issues of uh, gender-based violence or sexual, uh, sexual violence, we, we, we try to see how we're working with institutions that are having safe homes so that you know, this young person or this person who's facing the gender-based violence is moved into the safe home for a meantime as we go through all this wave of the pandemic and, and, and stabilize. So we also use the same opportunity if this young person is taking the refill at the same moment, he's also taking along with him or with her some, some, some SRH commodities like, like some condoms, male or female condoms, and also these different IEC materials on, 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 uh, on helplines for health workers that are willing to come and do, you, you know, uh, family planning uh, activities like, uh, like inserting an implant or, or, uh, or conducting, you know, these other family planning options that are beyond just the, the condom provision and all that. So yes, we are having all this integration going on uh, at, at all levels of our work. Great. Thank you, Moses. How, how many uh, people have cell phones in Uganda to enable this kind of virtual tracking and connectivity with young people? Is it pretty much universal? Oh, well, yeah, but the, now the levels of people who are having cell phones is it's quite in, increasing day in, day out. But uh, if if I'm to get the figure right here, yeah. Uh, let me just a minute. So well, maybe you may, go on, Moses. Yes. So in Uganda, we we. Uh, okay, uh, but as as I'm trying to find a document that gives me the actual figure, I think there are about eight million uh, users of internet. But the users of phones are, are running to about 20 plus million because we are about 40 million, the population in total. So I some of them... Yes, Moses, you're right. It's 51.5 percent. It's 51.1. Perfect, perfect. So, yeah. yes. so, uh, 
thank you, thank you for that one. So you see that, you know, many are having phones, but some of them are not having smartphones. That's why we see we bring in the option of making the direct phone calls and sending the SMSs. But right. the SMS is sometimes is limited to the end-to-end -end conversation. That the end-to-end -end conversation is not complete. It's more like delivering a text message and sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't. So with the phone call, you are having the end-to-end -end conversation. So you are able to get things finished at the very the time. For those who are having access to internet, most of them, those are young people in urban, urban centers, you know, and trading centers. Those ones, we are engaging them on the different platforms. The girls love Instagram. We are on Instagram, giving them the content. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 you know, the elite young guys uh, and ladies, they're, they're, on, they're on Twitter. We are giving them the content. Facebook is for everyone. We are giving them the content. So we are all over the place just trying to use different platforms using different strategies to make things happen. Moses, thank you. And thank you also, Violet, for your contributions to this. Uh, Violet, I, you know, we're out of time. We're in fact 10 minutes over. Um, but this is a very interesting question. Um, Deborah Van Zink, um, I, I'm afraid Lynn has now left the call, but I do notice your question and I will try to get that answered. Uh, a couple of people asked about apps. Um, and the availability of this kind of app information. So I'm going to suggest that we send out a follow-up email to uh, uh, the group that is on our learning collaborative with some more links and information uh, for the apps that, that, that might be available in case people are interested in this. It seems like there's a lot of enthusiasm for these kinds of tools. Um, I have one last question that I'd like to pose to Violet, if I may. And it's a very interesting yeah. question from Corrine. And she says that given the uneven implementation of alternative distribution mechanisms and all mm -hmm. on, on, on obviously variable access to clinics for those using public transport, are you being forced to triage clients into those that are going to get medicines because they have access in some way versus those that are simply not going to be able to get them because there is no mechanism in place to get the drug to them. Is that, is that a choice that you are having to make as providers at the front line? How would you think about that, Violet? Yeah, thank you very much. And that's a very important question. I ran through a bit of the methods that we have uh, picked up to ensure that our clients are getting their treatments. Now, we have to go into the monitoring and evaluation system. And uh, day in, day out, we are looking at it and ensuring that we are able to find out who is getting their medication and who is not. So every time we get into the system, we pick up those who have not had a drug pickup and then pick out on their phone contacts and call them. But of course, at some point we realized that we had the non-suppressors and they were getting monthly appointments. But uh, when it came to lockdown, it was very difficult for them to keep coming monthly to the health system. So those are picked out and then a counselor follows them up. Phone counseling is done and then they direct on where the medication is going to be picked from and then we have it delivered to them. So this is a system that we have picked up that we keep following up through the system of all the clients that we have to find out who has not got their treatment, whose appointment is supposed to be due and they haven't come, what was uh, the weight of the last consignment of medication that you took so that we are able to pick out. And we also have other implementing partners. So we are in touch with them. And when we know particular patients are stuck, we call them up and tell them this guy lives just next to you or they're in your catchment area. Can you supply them? And then we shall update. So it's work that is ongoing. And we have also picked out from lessons like we had the fast track model where someone just comes, has a drug pickup and they don't really have to see a clinician. But we realize that now that is the model that works everyone can be fast tracked in some way to reduce contact time in the health facility. Violet, thank you very much. Uh, difficult choices and difficult decisions to be made. Um, exactly. Uh, I think uh, at this point we are well over time. Uh, thank you for those of you that stayed the extra mile. I think more than half of you are still on the call. Um, uh, and thank you for your interest in this. I'm going to hand it back to uh, uh, Rike to just close out the call.
Thanks, Shafiq. And I just want to echo what you were saying. Um, it's been, we have had some really great uh, presentations as well as a, a rich discussion. So thank you to all the, the speakers. Uh, for the rest of you out there, I would just like to encourage all of you to join us um, and continue the discussion online after this webinar in the discussion forum that you can see on the screen on childrenandaids.org slash COVID-19 slash discussions. And by tomorrow, we will post a PowerPoint and a recording of this webinar on our COVID-19 and HIV Knowledge Hub, which is also on childrenaids.org slash COVID-19. And on this side, you can find um, previous uh, or recordings of previous webinars, a court selection of UNICEF and partner resources, and much more. So please do visit us. And if you have any feedback on this webinar or you have any suggestions for what you would like to see covered on our next webinar on COVID-19 and pediatric HIV, which will take place uh, in a month or so from now, we would really like to hear you. So please post your suggestion um, on the discussion forum or shoot me an email on the email address that you see listed on the screen as well. So thank you once again for taking the time to join us on the webinar today. And um, I'm wishing everyone a great rest of the day and bye for now.